I saw recently a letter that the Rebbe wrote to a shliach. And the letter was addressing the shliach's personal life as well as his public communal involvement. And uh, the Rebbe said, Shalom bias is exceedingly important in this generation. Important and difficult. Wouldn't you know it, ironically. Just the thing that's so important is also going to be the thing that's extra difficult in this generation. Why? Why is Shalom bias more important than ever and more difficult than ever in this generation? So that I've explained it in a way that's just so... If you're an observant Jew and you hear this explanation, it's like, of course, totally clicks, makes perfect sense. Any observant Jew knows what Friday afternoon is like. If you've ever brought in Shabbos in a Jewish home, no matter how late Shabbos is, it could be, it could be the summertime when we're lighting candles well after 8 o'clock. And it's always hectic in a Jewish home on Friday afternoon. And tensions are running high, and people are running from here to there, and now i got to go out again, i got to get this, i got to get that. And it's a time when a lot of things can uh, go wrong. People are stressed, and they're not as careful as they should be, and maybe they end up arguing. And of course, wouldn't you know it, like I said, when something is the most important, it also <laughs> tends to be the most challenging. When's the most important time of the week for peace in the home? It's Friday night when Shabbos comes in. First of all, when Shabbos comes in, the supernal husband and wife are uniting. Kud Shebrichu, the masculine energy of Hashem, is uniting with the Shechina, the feminine energy. So on high, there's a there's a marital union happening. And also here, every Jewish home, Friday night is the time for family to come together. It's a time to be in each other's presence, no matter what was happening during the, during the week. And especially a husband and a wife, it's a time of reconnecting, which reflects the reconnecting of the masculine and feminine divine on high. So Friday night is the most important time for there to be peace in the home. And in Hashem's infinite wisdom and wonderful sense of humor, he puts Friday afternoon, the most stressful time in the Jewish home, right before Friday night, the most important time for there to be peace. I mean, come on. If you're going to have the most stressful time and the most important time for there to be peace, at least space them out so you'll give us a fighting chance. And yet we all know that this is the rhythm of, of Jewish life. This is the way that it is. And you have to get through the stress and the intensity of the last minute rush of Friday afternoon precisely in order to be able to enter properly into the peace of Friday night. Okay, so that's the same thing in the macrocosm. We are living in the Erev Shabbos of history. It is late Friday afternoon in the timeline of history. What is it, 5783? So that's Friday afternoon. The year 6000 is when Shabbos enters for the entire world. Yem Shekulei Shabbos. So we're about to head into Yem Shekulei Shabbos, <laughs> which is precisely why everything's so crazy right now. And specifically why Shalom Bias is so challenging. So 
So we have to try harder. We have to focus more. We have to prioritize it more. We may have to do things that are not only our ancestors didn't have to do, but even your parents or grandparents, maybe they didn't have to focus this much, but we do. We do. Every time is unique. Every time has its special mitzvah, its special emphasis. So as we head into a time of world peace in the macrocosm and a time of peaceful homes in the microcosm, we need to really focus on peace within ourselves, in our family, our community, and ultimately the world. And we have to know it's going to be extra challenging. It's always stressful Friday afternoon, right before you head into Shabbos. But once Shabbos comes in, you can breathe. You give that sigh of relief. It's here. We made it. We're good. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about getting ourselves and our homes ready for peace, for the Shabbos of Mashiach. The Rebbe said many times, many times that this is the last generation of Gullus and the first generation of Geula. Lubavitchers, back me up. Is that true? Did I ever use that expression many times? And it's an interesting expression. Generation, I mean. Why did the Rebbe speak about it as a generation? When, when the Rambam talks about Mashiach, he calls it a zman. The Esai hazman, in that time, in that era, that epoch. Why does uh, the Rebbe refer to it as a doyer, as a generation? So I'll tell you what I think. This is just my humble opinion, based on my experience, based on what I see. It makes a lot of sense to me. A generation means, literally, parents having children and raising them. That's what a generation is. A generation isn't an amount of time. A generation is a relationship. It's a situation. Parents have children and raise them. That's a generation. So when the Rebbe said this is the last generation of Gaulus and the first generation of Geula, here's how I understand that. This is the last time that parents will be raising children in a Gaulus paradigm and the first time that parents will be raising children in a Mashiach paradigm. Now, the tricky part is, it's the same generation. <laughs> it's Friday afternoon, preceding Friday night. So we have to uh, be versatile. We have to be flexible. We have to be ready to, to bridge this gap, to be the last parents who raise our children with the Gullus paradigm and the first generation of parents who are raising our children in a, in a Gula paradigm. Okay, but th those are lofty words. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means like this. A Gullus paradigm means, well, Gullus is, is insanity. It's so crazy that when we're finally out of it, we'll look back on it and we'll describe it as dreamlike. We will have been as dreamers. It's a crazy time. Gaulus is crazy. 
It doesn't make sense. And when you're in an abnormal situation for centuries and millennia, you figure out how to survive. You ever heard of a normal reaction to an abnormal situation? Okay, so Gullus is the ultimate abnormal situation. And we do our best to adapt to it and to survive. And so your ancestors did what they thought they had to do to survive the horrors and the brutality and the confusion of exile. A world that looks completely disjointed, where it looks like there's no justice, there's no plan, there's no, there's no order. A world that's just crazy, a crazy world. And so throughout the generations, we've figured out ways of surviving, and we developed these defense mechanisms that made us feel safe, that made us feel like we won't be murdered, we won't be attacked in our home. If I can figure out how to do this, then I can survive. And various different people develop various different adaptations. Some of us come to believe that if we're tougher and meaner than anyone, then we'll be able to survive, then we won't die. Some of us come to believe that if we're sweet and charming and we get everybody's approval, then we won't die. Some of us come to believe that if we can make ourselves invisible, then no one will find us, then we'll survive, we won't die. And you gotta think about this. We're not just talking about one generation of these adaptations. We're talking about the compounding effect of generation after generation after generation. Because what happens is one generation comes to believe in a certain adaptation or defense mechanism or coping skill. And then they internalize it and knowingly or unknowingly hand it down to their children through their parenting style. And then that adaptation becomes transmitted from parent to child, and parent to child, and parent to child. So we're dealing not only with our own coping mechanisms that we picked up when we were confused little children, trying to feel safe in our home, but we're the inheritors of millennia of coping mechanisms. So think about how messed up we must be. But it makes sense that we're messed up because the situation is messed up, and we're just trying to survive in a messed up situation. So you get to a point where there's a lot, there are a lot of layers of these adaptations and they're not authentic to us. It's not our true self. It's not my pure neshama. My neshama is not neurotic. My neshama is innately healthy. But the ego, the survival mechanism, the God-given survival mechanism, learned how to do things that it thought it needed to do in order to survive. And I'm carrying that stuff. And in previous generations, perhaps they did not have the luxury of addressing that garbage because they were in survival mode. But in this generation, the last generation of Gaulus, the first generation of Gaula, now is the time to address all of the baggage that accumulated over the millennia and to set it down and to say, I don't know when it first appeared in my family, but I know when it's being set down. I know when it's ending. I will be the cycle breaker. I will be the last one to carry this false sense of security that this coping mechanism gives me. I will be the one to expunge the Aveda Zara. And I call it Aveda Zara for two reasons. First of all, because any coping mechanism other than a Muna and Betochen in reliance on Hashem is a Vedazara. But I also call it a Vedazara because it is foreign, it is Zar to us. It's not my authentic self. It's not my Neshama. It's my survival mechanism, my God-given survival mechanism known in 
Chassidus is the Nefsha Bahamas that does what it needs to do or thinks it needs to do in order to not die. But that's not my authentic self. So it's Aveda Zara, it is Zar, it is foreign to me, and I have to recognize it as such and let it go. And just because it was handed down to me by somebody else to whom it was foreign doesn't mean that I have to make it into a family heirloom. If my great, 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 great grandmother was traumatized, I have to realize she didn't want that survival mechanism adaptation. It was foreign to her. She didn't want that put on her. That was the wound of Gullis. That's not my great-great-grandmother. That's the Cossack who violated her. And I'm not going to carry on that survival mechanism just because my great-great-grandmother gave it to my great-grandmother who gave it to my grandmother who gave it to my mother. No! She didn't want it in the first place. Why should I carry it on and give it to my kids? We have to recognize it is foreign to us. It is not in sync with our neshamas. And just because your great-great-grandmother had it doesn't mean you have to nostalgize it and turn it into a family heirloom. Not everything we inherited has sentimental value. Some of it is garbage. They didn't want it. So why should you keep it? Why should you hold on to it? And this is the generation when all of this is happening. It's a unique time. It never happened before. Certainly not on a, whole, on a wholesale level the way I see it happening right now, in every community, in every home. So I have a monthly group of alumni of my parenting course. We have a men's group, we have a women's group. We get together on Zoom once a month. These are all people who have taken my six-week online parenting course. Some of them have taken it twice. Some have even taken it three times. It's a very high-level group. Do we have any people here who are in the monthly chesed group? Anybody? Yeah, one person? No. Oh, Tanya class. You're in my Tanya class. Weekly, Monday. Oh, also, yeah, Mrs. Pesner, for sure. Weekly Monday, Tanya class in five towns, 11 a.m. at the Lev Yitzchok Library on Central Avenue. Everyone's invited. We just finished chapter 43 of Tanya. But anyone here from the monthly uh, Chizik group, the alumni of the parenting course? Anybody here took the, the basic six-week parenting course? Okay, about 10 of you, okay. I highly recommend it. Um, so we have this monthly group, and the format is basically, at the beginning of each monthly meeting, I'll talk about a topic that's of interest to me, and then I open up the mics, and people can comment on what I spoke about, or they could bring up their own parenting issues. So... This month, for Menachem Av, I wanted to talk about Mashiach. So I said to them, this is last week, I said to them, this is the last generation of Golos, first generation of Geula. This is the generation that we're getting rid of all of the foreign stuff that was picked up over the generations, and we're, we're going to set it down. We're not going to carry it forward. We're not, we don't know who picked it up and brought it into our family line, but we know we're the ones who are going to let go of it so it disappears from our family line. We're not going to be the ones who hand it on to our children. That's what it means, the last generation of Gullus. Last generation of Gullus just means the cycle breakers, the people who are not going to hand it on to their children. And, and I started describing how should you feel when you encounter this this Aveda Zoda. I said, uh, there are different reactions. Sometimes people become very preoccupied with the schmutz. And they start to talk about it a lot. And they identify with it. And it becomes like a new preoccupation. It becomes a new focus. Which is an interesting pendulum swing. For generations, nobody had personal problems. It didn't exist. 
Everybody's normal. And then all of a sudden the floodgates opened and we realized that we do have problems and we do need to heal. But then it went to the opposite extreme where people started just getting really, really enamored with their problems. And it becomes like a focus. It becomes a constant thing. I'm revisiting, rehashing. I said, when you discover the Aveda Zoda, just drop it. Just let it go. In fact, I told them, you don't even have to fight with it. It's foreign to you anyway. You just have to purge it. And even the purging can be gentle. You know, we get rid of toxins in a lot of ways. But it doesn't have to be violent. It doesn't have to be vomiting. I said, you know how the, the main way you get rid of toxins is through breath? <sighs> when you lose weight, the main way that the weight leaves your body, it's, it's wild, is through, is through breath. So our ancestors were up against a massive juggernaut. The clipper they were fighting was this dark, looming tower, this, this wall so wide you can't see one end or the other. And they couldn't even crack it with a massive sledgehammer. And they were strong, mighty, great people. They were spiritual giants, our ancestors. But the clipper was formidable, and they couldn't put a dent in it. And today we're weak, puny little people. We're fragile people. But you know what? The clipper today is like so much dust. It's brittle. And all you have to do to expel it, you just blow on it and it, it, it flies away. There's nothing left to it. You just have to recognize that what it is. It's clipper. It's not me. It's not authentic. It's not my true self. I don't want this. And then you just blow on it and it flies away. No, I'm not fearful. I'm not manipulative. I'm not a people pleaser. I, I'm... I'm not angry. I'm not full of rage. These are the overlays. These are the adaptations to the wounds of Gullus that, that accumulated in my life and in my ancestors' lives. But it's not me, and I don't want it. And I'm sending it away. So I said to them, this is what I'm saying to the monthly, uh, we call it the Chizik group, to the mon monthly mothers, so I said to them, I don't know why, I made up this silly marshal. I said, imagine a Frum family is cleaning for Pesach, the night before Pesach, the night of Bedikas Chametz. And they look under the couch and they find a Tzalem. I just said it as a silly marshal. I said, what do you want them to do now? And they're freaked out, what's going on here? And it's not like they bought the house from non-Jews. They built the house. <laughs> so they can't figure out, how did this Salem get here? Whose is this? Right? So I said, one reaction is they could take the Salem, they could put it under glass, uh, on the mantle, they could shine lights on it, and we could all stand around, stare at it, and be revolted. Oh, look at this terrible thing that we found. And we could revisit every day and just be disgusted and shocked over again. Look at this Salem that we found in our home. Right. I said, that's one reaction. Or you could put it with the chametz and burn it in the morning. Fight the gagangin. Oh, I found this thing. It's obviously not mine. I don't know who picked it up. I don't know who in this family brought it in here. But it's not us. And now that I see it, we're getting rid of it. Boom. Simple as that. So I said, it's a silly marshal, huh? It's a weird marshal. What? No, I just made it up. No, I made it up on the spot. But I liked it. So I said it again. Maybe a few minutes later. And I was like, a Frum family is cleaning for Pesach. And they find a Salem under the couch. What do you want them to do? Put it on the mantle, shine lights on it, put it under glass, and everyone stands around and, and is revolted by it and shocked by it every day after day after day? Or should they just put it with the chametz and burn it in the morning? And move on with life? And then I said it a third time. A Frum family is cleaning for Pesach. I didn't say it like back to back to back to back. It's a 90-minute format. So I waited a few minutes, and I just kept looping back to this marshal. I don't know why. I just felt it really conveys the attitude of the cleansing that has to happen in this generation. So I said, a Frum family is cleaning for Pesach the night before Pesach. They find a Salem under the couch. Oh, no, everyone's horrified. What do you want them to do? They should all stand around and look at it day after day after day, or they should put it with the chametz and burn it in the morning. And finally, this woman on the group, it's a Zoom meeting, she says, Rabbi, hold on a second. 
you keep saying this. You keep saying this. I don't know why you keep saying this, but I have to say something. I said, go ahead. She said, I have a tailor. I know this woman. She's a very, very from woman. So I, I thought she's speaking metaphorically. She says, in my car, right now, for the past three years, doesn't sound metaphorical anymore. So I'm like, what's going on? This is a very from lady. So she tells the story. Her great-grandfather was a Moroccan Jew in Gibraltar. That's an island in the Mediterranean, south of Spain, north of Morocco. And in fact, they are descended from the Erechaim Kodesh. prominent Jewish family. And uh, so her great-grandfather moved to Brazil. Not even to the big cities where there were more Jews, but to the Amazon. There was some type of commercial opportunity there. Shortly after he moved to Brazil, so this Moroccan Jew, this woman's great-grandfather, his wife passes away, his young wife. They have a little daughter, and her mother passes away. I'm talking about the great-grandmother of the woman speaking. So she says, my great-grandfather didn't know what to do. How's he going to raise this girl? So, you know, the Catholic Church is very, very strong in, well, all of Latin America, but certainly in Brazil. So the Catholic Church came, and they said, we'll take your daughter. Send her, send her to us. And he didn't know what to do. He sent her. And she went to a Catholic school. This little Moroccan Jewish girl, orphaned, lost her mother. And the nuns used to scream at her. They would even beat her. When they would prepare food, they would tell her, you stay away, keep your filthy Jewish hands away from the food. And this is what she was subjected to day after day. And one day, she was home. She was at the dinner table. And uh, she picked up a fork and a knife. And she made an image. An image that she saw every day, hundreds of times a day, at the Catholic school where her father sent her. She made the... She took the fork and the knife and she put them together and she made the... The image. And her father was horrified. And I'm sure full of self-hatred because he was, after all, the one who sent her to the Catholic school. And he beat her. So she was sent to the Catholic school where the nuns beat her for being a Jew. And then when she came home and she imitated what she saw in that Catholic school, her father beat her for not being... for not having the strength, for not having the ability to find clarity and to make sense out of an insane situation that even an adult would find deeply confusing. How is a child supposed to make sense of it? I mean, this is the gullus. This is how profoundly maddening the gullus is. You have this sweet girl, a descendant of the Orachayim HaKadosh, and she's confused, and she's, she just doesn't want to be screamed at. She doesn't want to be beaten and berated. Well, what do, you, what do you expect? What do you think happened? You want a miracle story? You're not going to get one, at least not in her lifetime, because she became a Catholic, she was baptized, and she married a Catholic, this little girl. And she had a daughter. You want a miracle story? You're not going to get one in that generation either because that daughter also was baptized and married a Catholic.
And that daughter's daughter had a daughter. And the daughter's daughter's daughter was discovered by a shliach of the Lubavitcher Rebbe and told that she was Jewish and went to seminary and got married and lives today in Brooklyn and raises a, an incredibly ehrlich from beautiful, wonderful Hasidic family. But you see, if you would look from the outside, you'd say, what a wonderful, nice family. But what you don't realize is, this woman is carrying wounds. You wouldn't know that. Of course you wouldn't know it. But she's carrying wounds because her mother's mother the one who was orphaned and sent to Catholic school was wounded. And her gullus adaptations, her defense mechanisms, were that she went so far as her Aveda Zara was kapshuta, literal Aveda Zara. She embraced the religion of her oppressors in order to feel safe in this insanity called gullus. Now she passed away, the grandmother passed away. And when she did pass away, this woman, her granddaughter, confiscated her literal idols. She had literal idols, statues. She told me, she described, she said her grandmother had literal idols, little statues, figure, figures. And she said she used to make clothing for them and dress them. And when she passed away, I want to tell you how confusing this gullus is. When the shliach wanted to make sure that this woman is Jewish, he said, take me to your grandmother. And he met the grandmother, the, the practicing Catholic grandmother, the baptized grandmother who has statues and makes clothing for them. And the shliach meets the grandmother and says, tell me what you remember from your childhood. And she makes a bracha hamaitzi for him, and he laughs, and he says, I've, I haven't heard such authentic Moroccan pronunciation of a hamaitzi bracha. I haven't heard in, in generations. I mean, this is the authentic old school in the middle of the Amazon, right? That's how confusing this gullus is. The Arachayim HaKadosh has an anical who's this deeply confused. So the granddaughter confiscated the idols. She got rid of them. But the grandmother was also, uh, she sold jewelry. So the granddaughter inherited a bunch of the jewelry. A bunch of different pieces. And one day, the granddaughter is going through the jewelry and she discovers a piece that is a tzalem. And obviously she's not shocked. She knows what her grandmother did. She knows what things she was into. It wasn't shocking, but it was upsetting. It was upsetting. And she said, I don't want this. I don't want this in my house. So she called the rav. And she said, I have this piece of jewelry, and it's at Salem, and I'm just, it's my grandmother's, and I, 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 don't, I don't want it. I want, what am I supposed to do with this? So the Rav spoke to her, and it wasn't one of the pieces that she actually worshipped. That's a different din. That's dealt with halachically differently. It was ornamental. There's a difference. If it was actually an object of worship or if it was just a decoration. So this was just a decoration. So the Rav told her, you don't have to destroy it, but you can't hold on to it, so sell it. And you could even keep the money. So she said, the Rav told her to do this. So she's got the Salem in her house, and she's like, well, I don't want it in my house. So she said, I put it in the car. 
And I figured next time I'm out driving, I'll go to a jeweler and I'll sell it. She said, well, every time I was in the car and I thought about selling the Salem, I got, I froze. Because I thought to myself, how am I going to walk into the jeweler and I'm a recognizably orthodox woman and I have this crazy thing. I can't do this. She couldn't do it. She froze. She couldn't bring herself to walk into the jeweler and sell the Salem. So instead what happened, it sat in the glove box for a day and a week and a month and a year and finally three years. For three years, it's sitting in the glove box. And she says to me, intermittently, yeah, I remember that it's there. And I say, i got to get rid of this thing. What if my children, my sweet little chassidisha children, can you imagine the trauma? These sweet little chassidisha children, if they would accidentally open the glove box and, and happen upon this Salem, they would be horrified and confused and shocked. What's going on? Does mommy secretly worship? I mean, you understand the, the game she's playing, the risk she's running. But she couldn't bring herself. She couldn't physically bring herself to bring this piece of jewelry into the shop and to sell it and get rid of it. She couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. She couldn't look at it. She couldn't touch it. She couldn't, she couldn't do it. So instead of purging it, she's carrying it. And she's carrying it and carrying it and running the risk that her children are going to discover it. I told her, I said, that's what happens and when we're afraid to purge the Aveda Zorah that was picked up in our family, so instead we hold on to it, we run the risk our children will discover it and think we worship it. Think about that for a second. The Aveda Zorah, the sickness, the adaptation that you're carrying, whether it's rage or fear or lust, Whatever it is, whatever your distraction is, your coping mechanism is, you know it's not you. You know it's not clean. You don't want it. But your child doesn't know that. And they'll think you're holding on to it because it has value to you. They'll think you're holding on to it because you worship it. So if we don't cleanse these idols, our children may actually learn a false religion from us, God forbid. How am I doing? My, two of my daughters are sitting in the front row. Rachel and Esther. Are you guys following? Are you into this? Okay. I'm checking in with them. You, you already heard the story as it was happening, right? They were there while it was unfolding. So uh, I told this lady, we got to get rid of this thing. It's time to purge this. It's time to cleanse it from your family line. Your grandmother didn't want it. She picked it up as a defense mechanism to the nuns who were beating her. It's not her. And now it's made it to you. She couldn't purge it. She couldn't get rid of it. But this is the last generation of Gullus. You will purge it. You will get rid of it. You'll be the one to get rid of it. And you'll set your grandmother free. So she's the next, well, actually we called the Rav again because it had been three years since she got the psak, what to do. So I actually called the Rav and I said, I know this sounds like a very impractical question. You're probably not rushing to answer this. And it was the beginning of the nine days and he said, I'm dealing with all these questions of mikvah and khfifa and like I, nine days questions. I can't be dealing with, you know, weird questions about uh, Aveda Zoda. I said, it's extremely practical and the healing of an entire family and family line depends on the swift answer of this question. So to his credit, he uh, fast-tracked the Shila, and he got back to her, he told her, he told her the same thing he told her three years ago, which is she didn't worship it, 
It's just ornamental, so sell it. Okay, so he told her the same thing he told her three years ago. Anyways, I get a, a WhatsApp. She's saying, I'm in front of the pawnbroker and I can't go in. She's freezing again. Same thing, same story from the past three years. I can't go in. They're going to look at me. What am I, what am I going to say? What are they going to think? Do you understand the, how brilliant the Yetzirah is? And I want to stop everyone right now, and I just want to check in with you. This is not a story about this woman. This is a story about everyone here. And if you don't know it's about you, think harder. We all discover something horrifying that we don't want and we innately know is foreign to us and doesn't belong in our lives and doesn't belong in our family. But precisely because it's so horrifying, we can't even go through with taking out the garbage because we don't want anyone to look at it long enough to spell it. And so what do we do instead? We hold on to it. I told her, you're going to go in there right now and you're going to set your grandmother's soul free. She's waiting for this. You're the one who's going to end this. Your great-grandfather did what he thought he needed to do. And we can't judge him. He was in a foreign land, a completely... He wasn't prepared. He wasn't... Her great-grandfather was not prepared. He was going to go halfway across the world, move to the jungle in South America, and his young wife was going to die and leave him to raise a precious daughter. He wasn't prepared for that. We can't judge him. And we certainly can't judge the grandmother who was beaten and berated by these nuns. But you know what? We're, we're, we're in an unusual situation. Thank God. We're in a situation where we're not dealing with the real life or death issues that our ancestors dealt with. Instead, it's quiet enough that we can start to do the spot cleaning that they didn't have the luxury to do. People always ask, well, why do these issues all of a sudden come up now? Maybe if you had a more traumatizing life, you wouldn't be able to think so much about your problems. Which is really a cruel and absurd way of responding to the uniqueness of this generation. The reason that our ancestors didn't have time to deal with these issues like emotional healing is because they were dealing with life and death. Is because for many of them, it was a reality that they may put their children to bed tonight without any food. And they didn't know where they were getting food from the next day. So no, they didn't have time for emotional healing. But we who can go shopping with a credit card, you're going to tell me that's stressful. Yeah, it's stressful. APR is stressful. But it's not as stressful as putting your children to bed night after night without food. So now, where the coast is relatively clear, and we're not in life and death mode, we're not in survival mode, yeah, of course, we are doing the cleansing the previous generations didn't have the luxury to focus on. So I told her, you go in there right now, and you get rid of this, and you be the one to cleanse it and end it in your family line. This is a cleansing, I told her. It's a purification. So she comes back out a minute later. She says, the jeweler gave me 40 bucks. She tells me, mem saw. 40 is the measure of units of a kosher mikveh. She says, this is a mikveh. This is my grandmother's purification. I told her, you're 100% correct. And I also advised her that you should take the, the money now and take it to the mikveh and donate it to the mikveh, which she did. She sponsored a tefillah for whoever, the next person who can't pay for it, so it's covered now. So that's a story that happened last week. And it's an interesting story. It's, I mean, there's a reason why I told it. Obviously, it's story worthy. But 
don't be mistaken to think that that story is unique. It is not unique at all. Every single family in this generation has the same story. It may not be a literal Salem, but it is some form of Aveda Zara, meaning some adaptation that is foreign to your neshama, some coping mechanism that you or an ancestor picked up to give you a false sense of safety and security in a crazy world. And you are the one, not your mother, not your grandmother, not your great-grandmother, you are the one with the opportunity to address it and to do the emotional healing and to say, it ends with me. I don't pass this on to my children. I don't even keep it hidden in a glove box in the car where my children may find it. I release it. I get rid of it. It's not mine. It's not my grandmother's. It's none of ours. It doesn't belong to us. <sighs> get rid of it. And I, when I'm doing the breath, I'm literally talking about breathing. We're holding this stuff in our bodies Okay, so expunge it, expel it. That's how you get rid of toxins. Breathe it out. It's not a wrestling match. We don't have to grapple with it and allow it to make us dirty. We don't have to identify with it. We don't have to turn it into a constant topic of conversation. We just have to spot it to identify that this is not authentic to us, this is not our neshama, and to say, I don't know who pick it, picked it up, I'm not judging whoever picked it up, but I'm the one who's going to release it. So my children will be the first generation in my family who are free from it, first generation of Geula. So let's talk a little bit about marriage. How does Hashem so perfectly orchestrate that the two people who have exactly the wounds that will trigger each other's wounds end up living together and trying to raise a family. It's uncanny. You'd have to be Hashem to orchestrate it that perfectly. In other words, we all have wounds. But we can figure out how to put ourselves into situations that will be less likely to trigger our wounds. Hashem somehow figures out how to put you with the person that you really can't get away from without completely upending your whole life. And that's the person who has the wounds that trigger your wounds and you have the wounds that trigger theirs. Uncanny, every time. So the lady, let's say, who's obsessed with planning. Her Aveda Zoda is planning. I have to have a schedule in writing or I feel terrified. I feel life is chaotic. And when I have a schedule in writing, that's my getchka. It makes me feel calm. It makes me feel at peace. Then I feel like I'm okay. Right? That's her gullus adaptation. So she'll marry the guy who has the exact opposite adaptation. For him, if I have to commit to any plan, any time, I feel boxed in. I feel suffocated. The only way I can feel alive, the only way I can feel safe and free is if there's no plan, right? So then Hashem will take that lady and that man and Mazel tov, now go try to run a home. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Try to run a home and try not to trigger each other. So you got to think that maybe marriage is not exactly what we thought it was. We thought that marriage was a relationship and that a good marriage is a good relationship. A successful marriage is where the relationship works well, we thought. And I'm not negating 
that having a deep connection with your spouse has value. But I don't think it's the essence of marriage. I think the essence of marriage is what our sages tell us, that when you have ish and isha, so then you have the shechina, you have the ish yudke, and that every marriage is about making the world a little bit more godly. Every marriage is about making the world a little bit more godly. Some marriages are zeicha, that one of the ways they make the world more godly is that they have a wonderful, loving, trusting, intimate bond with each other. And that certainly brings the Shekhinah into the world. But that's not the only way that marriage brings godliness into the world. A much more basic way that marriage brings the Shekhinah into the world is by forcing each and every one of us to get rid of our character defects, our Aveda Zoda, and to allow Hashem into that place. In other words, forget about the relationship for a second. This is not about anyone else. This is about you. This is a solo project. This is not about communication. This is not about expressing your needs. This is not about sitting at the negotiation table with the marriage counselor. This is a solo project. This is totally internal. I have my own work to do. Work that I would never be forced to do if I could have stayed single my whole life. Think about it. If you could just avoid marriage, then you would never have to really deal with some of the deep, dark stuff. Because you would just avoid situations which trigger that stuff. But then Hashem puts you in a situation where there's another person who just like you can't help but to be triggered, they can't help but to trigger you because <laughs> their wounds are exactly the corresponding or opposite wounds to yours. And whatever it is that you think you'll die without is the opposite of what they think they'll die without. And now you have two people sitting there and thinking, I have to be this, I have to have this. If I don't, then I'll explode. And you could, you could say, well, you know what we got to do? We got to sit them both down and we have, to, we have to talk them down. We have to negotiate a peace. Okay, you could do that. But that would be such a shame because then you'd be forfeiting an opportunity a unique opportunity for growth. Instead of figuring out how to get your spouse to accommodate your triggers, how about you address those triggers yourself? And maybe when you purge the klippa, the vedazara, and you get healthier and you get cleaner and lighter, maybe then afterwards you could re- Engage, you could go back to the negotiation table and you could try communication when you're in a less, des in a less desperate mode, when it, you don't feel like you'll die. Let me, let me explain what I mean. So each of us was raised in a family and that family was imperfect because as good and great as your parents may have been, they raised you in Gullis, and the Gullis is a crazy place. So each one of us picked up certain defense mechanisms that made us feel safe. Some of us learned how to be mean and nasty and to scare away the threat. Some of us learned how to be invisible, how to hide. Some of us learned how to be eloquent to dazzle people with our words, and that made us feel safe. Some of us learned to be pretty and charming, and that made us feel safe. And of course, it's a, an illusion. It's a false sense of security, because really, our safety only comes from Hashem. 
But in Gullus, we think these things can give us safety. Some of us began to believe that if we'll be financially successful, if we'll have money, then we're safe. Or if people like us, then we'll be safe. And again, these things are Aveda Zorah because I, for two reasons, like I said before. They're not God, so why do we rely on them? So that's why they're Aveda Zorah. But also, Aveda Zorah literally means it's foreign. It's Zar. It's foreign to me. It's not the real me. It's an, it's an overlay. It's an adaptation. It's something I picked up. And what's more, maybe even it's not my adaptation. Maybe it's my mother's or my father's or my grandfather's or my grandmother's. Or maybe it goes back a hundred generations. I don't know how far back it goes, but it's just a line of people, good people, trying to feel safe in a crazy world and coming to believe that various different things are the answer. We could have carried that stuff forward forever if we had the luxury to avoid triggering situations. But in his infinite wisdom, what does Hashem do? He pairs us with somebody who's going to push our buttons. Not because they're malicious and they want to push our buttons, but because just like we can't help but to be triggered, they can't help but to trigger us. Because, and, and again, think about the self-justification that we have. No, I'm not trying to be mean, but we have to, whatever it is, whatever your addiction is, we have to plan, we have to talk, we have to not plan, we have to not talk. We have to have money in the bank. No, we have to spend our money. Whatever it is, these are compulsions, these are beliefs, deep, deep beliefs. And they feel like you're going to die if you don't give in to these beliefs. Because they come from the survival mechanism, the God-given survival mechanism called the Nefesh Bahamas. That's how Tanya calls it, the animal soul. And just like an animal, it is chiefly involved in self-preservation. And it only knows one mode, life and death. So when it starts to believe that I need money to survive or approval to survive or I need to be pretty to survive, whatever these things are that it comes to believe in, it's always life and death. It only knows, there's no nuance in the, in, the, in the animal soul. Everything feels like life and death. That's what it's programmed for. So then you think, or you're not you, your false self, your ego, your animal soul thinks, I'll die if I don't have money in the bank. I get Married to a person feels, I'll die. If I do have money in the bank, we have to spend it. And now, go try to have a peaceful home together. Don't you understand the opportunity Hashem has given you? If this is the generation of cleansing, if this is the generation where we finally get rid of the gullus adaptations, and we only rely on Hashem, and we finally get in touch with our true authentic selves, our neshamas, then marriage is the most valuable laboratory in which to do that work. Because nothing is going to force you to do the work like marriage. So if there's a sore spot, if there's a stress point, if there's a place that keeps getting hurt, Let's set aside for a moment the other person. Set aside for a moment, well, what they did was wrong. It doesn't matter. That's not going to help you to figure out whether they were wrong. I don't care if they had to break through a hundred commandments in order to get to a point where they hurt you and touched your sore spot. That's not relevant for your work. What's relevant for your work is, where does this sore spot come from? Why am I sensitive in this place? Why have I come to believe that this is what keeps me safe, and that if I don't have this, I'll die? And I'm not saying that whatever your complaint is, isn't a valid complaint. Maybe it is valid. But let's lose the intensity. Let's lose the life or death intensity of the, of the animal soul, and then come back and revisit from a rational place. where you can actually make a choice whether it's something you can live with or not. And maybe you'll choose the, oh, I can't live with it. Okay. 
but then it'll actually be a rational choice, not a compulsion, not a defense mechanism, not a reflex or an instinct of an animal. And then another thing happens, a wonderful thing happens. When you can lose the intensity of turning these defense mechanisms into idols and thinking that they are your salvation and your safety, a wonderful thing happens. You get to revisit these character traits in a sober way. See, I remember during the OJ case, and they asked the toxicologist if something is a toxin. He said, toxicologists don't talk about toxins, they talk about toxicity. He said, a toxin is a thing, it's a noun, it's a name of something. He said, anything can be toxic. Water could be toxic, there's something called water poisoning. I mean, you'd have to drink so many gallons of it that probably physically you wouldn't be able to do it. But there is an amount of water. You know what water poisoning is? When you dilute the bloodstream so much, the, there's no more electrolytes, and the synapses can't carry an electric current, and a person has seizures. Just from water, too much water. So he says anything can become toxic if you have too much of it. So don't ask me, is this a toxin? Anything can become toxic. It's a matter of degree. So when we talk about character defects, character defects are not a what, they're a how. The what is just a way of being, it's just a certain quality. The defective part of it is when it exceeds its functionality and then it becomes toxic. In other words, let's say that when you were little, in order to feel safe, you developed a certain skill. You figured out that being smart would make people like you and make you safe, make you feel safe. So you became a precocious little know-it-all, little professor, they call it, always showing how smart you are. And when that becomes your survival mechanism, you can't stop doing it because you'll feel like you'll die if you stop. And then it becomes a character defect because you can't stop. And then you start doing it when it's inappropriate. You start doing it even when it's bothering people. You start doing it even when it interrupts intimate relationships. And people you care about say, will you stop already? Stop being a know-it-all? And you hate it and I want to stop, but I can't stop because this is what I came to believe keeps me safe. So I can't expunge it. And that becomes a character defect. But the wonderful thing happens is when you start to rely on Hashem for your safety and security, this ego, which had overextended itself as a grab for safety and security, this ego which had spread itself out, which is why, by the way, we compare the dysfunctional ego to chometz as opposed to matzah. Matzah is flat and manageable. It's a healthy self. Chometz is puffed up, sticking out. It's too big. So this quality became too big in an attempt to grab safety and security. And now what's it doing? It's bumping into people. And it's getting bumped into. The part of you that's sticking out too far is the part that keeps getting jostled and broken and scraped. A guy once went to the third Chabad Rebbe, the Tzamech Tzadik, and he complained. He said, everyone in shul steps all over me. And the Tzamech Tzadik said, what should they do when you spread yourself out over the whole shul, everywhere they step is on you. He wasn't saying it to chide him. He was giving him loving counsel. When you're coming into shul and you're spreading out your ego to get your emotional needs met, you will always leave hurt. You walk into any room with the anticipation of meeting your emotional needs, you will leave that room hurt. Because people are not going to have your rules to your game. They're not going to know how to walk and tiptoe around your idol. And they're going to mistakenly bump into it. Many times with their character defects, which they think are live or die. So what happens is, 
when we stop overextending ourselves in an attempt to grab safety and security from places that can't offer it to us because only Hashem can offer us safety and security, when we stop doing that, the ego shrinks back to a manageable size. And then wouldn't you know it, that character defect, it's still there, but it's there in a healthy size. So if I learned how to be smart as a defense mechanism, when I stop relying on, it, relying on it as a defense mechanism and I rely only on Hashem, I'm still smart. I still have that quality. It's just now I get to use it by free choice. I don't have to use it. It's not a compulsion. It's not I feel I'll die if I don't use it. I won't die. Hashem has me. But I have this ability, and now I get to choose whether or not it's appropriate to use it. And when I'm in my healthy mode, where I'm relying fully on Hashem, you know what is the sole criterion that I use to determine whether or not to use a character trait or not? If my defense mechanism is I learned how to be perseverant, and then it exceeded its functionality, and I became domineering, and I just steamroll everybody. Okay, when I stop worshiping that character defect as a, as a getchka, as a Nove Zora, and I start believing in Hashem, Hashem has me, and I don't have to steamroll people in order to feel safe. And what happens is, I'm safe, I'm calm, I'm sober, but I still have that character trait, but now it's, now it's a useful character trait. Now I have what you call um, stick to determination. The trait's still there. It's just not dysfunctional anymore. And now I get to go back to it and use it in a healthy way, which means, I told you, there's one criterion. When I finally become healthy again, there's one criterion, one question I ask myself before I make use of any particular skill or gift or resource or trait. You know the one question I ask myself before I use a trait is? Will it benefit my maker or his children? And if it does, then I use it. And if, this, and if this situation is one where it wouldn't benefit my maker or his children, then I don't use it, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I don't have to use it. I can sit here and be calm. I'm, I'm okay. I'm safe. So this is it. This is the generation. The healing happens now. The cleansing happens now. You want to know what to cleanse? You want to find your Salem? Whatever is the recurring issue in your marriage, that's the first one. And I'm not saying that everyone is, uh, is, is innocent. In other words, maybe your spouse is doing something wrong. Maybe they are. But that's not relevant right now. What's relevant is, why is it affecting me the way it's affecting me? Let me become emotionally sober, and then I can revisit the issue. Why is this a weak point? Why is this a sore spot? Maybe it's something I picked up in my childhood. Maybe it's something that the people who parented me picked up in their childhood. Maybe it's something the people who parented, the people who parented me picked up in their childhood, and on and on and on and on. It doesn't matter when it started. This is the generation that we release it the anger and the fear, the people pleasing, the lust for money, for the false lure of financial security, for physical pleasures, the distractions, all that stuff which is not authentic to us. We just leave it. We leave it. And when it crops up, it rears its head, you identify it for what it is. And you expel it again. This is the time. This is the generation. And don't say to me, why was it never done before? That's like saying, why didn't Mashiach come earlier? This is the time when it happens. It's a unique time, a fascinating time to be alive and an even more fascinating time to be married and to raise children. 
this is the call of the hour. It's Friday afternoon. It feels intense. But really, we're about to go into some incredible peace and well-being. We're about to go into a state where we can just let go and feel Hashem's abundant love and security. Is lunch ready? Lunch is ready. Okay, so we'll eat. Let the people eat, and then we'll... Okay. 